In the four decades since his death, Bob Marley has become so iconic that it's hard to believe he was ever a real person. Thankfully, in addition to the wealth of music he left behind, there's also a trove of photographs documenting his brief, impactful life. In 2020, to commemorate what would have been Bob's 75th birthday, Ziggy Marley curated a book of photographs of his dad called Bob Marley, Portrait of the Legend. Ziggy has, of course, gone on to become a reggae icon in his own right and is now an eight-time Grammy winner, a philanthropist, author, and keeper of his dad's legacy, along with the rest of the Marley family. Today, we'll hear Malcolm Gladwell and Ziggy talk about the turbulence in 70s Jamaica, caused by two opposing political parties. Ziggy recalls the night gunmen ambushed the Marley house, shooting his mother and Bob, both whom thankfully survived. And Ziggy answers the question we all want to know. Was the famously soccer-obsessed Bob Marley really any good on the field? This is Broken Record, liner notes for the digital age. I'm Justin Richmond. Here's Malcolm Gladwell and Ziggy Marley. This conversation was taped live as part of the Live Talks Los Angeles series. This book that you've done with all of these photos of your father, it had a kind of personal resonance for me because, as you may know, my mom is Jamaican. When I was growing up in the 70s, we would go to Jamaica every year, every Christmas. And all these, so many of these photos are from the Jamaica that I remember as a kid. It's funny. It's like, I mean, it's very personal for you, but in this weird, indirect way, it's personal for me too. You know how when you look at a photo of Jamaica, you can smell Jamaica? I could, <laughs> yeah. I could smell I could smell Jamaica again. It's this lovely, like, took me back to my childhood. What led you to want to do this book? So over the years, we've, we've collected a lot of photographs of Bob um, from different photographers and stuff like that. And, you know, usually I think the photographs you see of Bob are iconic photographs, you know? You always see the iconic images. And so for this, we came up on the 75th birthday anniversary. And I felt like, let's do something special for the 75th. Let's take some of these photos we have in our archives and put together a photo book. Um, the family has never done one before. Other people have done one. Mm-hmm. And I totally understand what you said when you talk about you smell Jamaica, the photos, because doing the book, it, like, it brought me back to that time too. You know, mm-hmm. when I'm looking at it, just, it's like, it's such a, it's such a real experience, a real thing that... When I was looking at the photos, it you know, it, everything just kind of came back to me. Yeah. When you say, I was just thinking logistically, you said, this is really the family's book. There's so many of you. How on earth did you guys, did you guys coordinate picking all of these photos? Did you have like a family council where you all sat down <laughs> and went through them? <laughs> no, no. Well, I, I was given the task. Oh, I was I given that responsibility of going through the photos. That's what we do. We kind of delegate responsibilities. Yeah. You know, say so everybody, hey, this, all right, this is your project. You have, you have the family's approval and blessing. It's your project. Go ahead and do it, you know? Yeah. Well, tell me about your your memories of your father. You So you're born in 68. So you, yeah. when he dies, you're you're just a teenager. Yeah. Is it, so I'm going on 13, yeah. Yeah. Tell me, tell me a little bit about what you remember of your father. Well, everything. I mean, there's nothing to forget, really, because the limited experience we've had with him, you know, everything was memorable and left an a everlasting impact on my psyche. You know what I'm mm-hmm. Everything, it was like going to school, but a different type of school. You know what I'm saying? Like, so growing up with Bob, I mean, there was different elements. It was the fun side, happy side, you know, play around with children. We would travel to the countryside, his hometown, um, every now and again. And it's funny, I remember those days there were no seat belts. He would have me in a lap in the front seat. Mm-hmm. No seat belt, no, no, no airbag. No, none. Yeah, yeah. I, I believe me, I remember that. I remember, I remember being stuck in the Jamaica in the back of a Volkswagen Beetle driven by my uncle. Yeah. And, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah my, my mom had one of those too. She had one of those Beetles too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, um, but I mean, and then there was a serious side. It was the, what I saw was a lot of discipline. This man, I love work hard. This man, I love discipline. This man, he's from the countryside. And him, 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 he's so root, rooted in his humility that for him to come back to his hometown or go back to Trenchtown in the ghetto, it was like 
it's just a, it's just Bob. This is just Bob. It's not like Bob the the superstar, Bob the whatever. You know, it's just Bob. So I mean, lot, lots of soccer, lots of football, soccer music, soccer music, and the spiritual side of it was a very powerful thing. And um, Bob always loved having Bible, and he would take me and my brother Stephen to these um what you call them? It's like service, like you know, people go to church service or mm -hmm. people go to the synagogue or the mosque. Well, we had this thing called Naya Bingis and we would it would be like some weird time of the night and it was such a mystical, that's why I say it left such an impression on me as a child. Because it was such a, the, the Naya Bing was such a mystical thing, you know, smoke, fire, drums, singing, chanting, and a whole spiritual vibe, you know. So, yeah, you know, we grew up in that kind of environment where every memory really is stuck with us and the memory is stuck with us more than just a memory. It's stuck with us as like, I experienced that as kind of molded us into who we are today, you mm -hmm. know? So it's a, it's, a, it's a real heavy thing, you know? It's heavy. Yeah. The other part of it that's fascinating to me, as I said earlier, was the Jamaica of that period, which is Jamaica in the 70s. So many of these photos are about Jamaica in the 70s, and Jamaica in the 70s is an intense place. I mean, politics is manly and Siaga and there's violence and there's gun court and there's <laughs> reggae and there's you know don quarry winning gold medal i mean it's just it's sort of like there's so i remember I go there as a kid it's just like so much i was coming yeah, from yeah. rural canada where nothing happened yeah. to a place where everything was happening talk can you talk a little bit about that i mean you're in the epicenter of this because your yeah. father was at the was the kind of in the middle of the of the maelstrom yeah, there were certain mileposts that I can like remember about the seventies, especially the uh, the more um, turbulent times, the politics. So we can go back. I remember um, the night my parents were shot. Right, mm -hmm. I remember before my mother left to go to rehearsals. I was like, "Yo, mommy, take me to rehearsals. I wanted to go. I wanted to go to rehearsals." She said, "No, like you have school tomorrow," and I was like very like angry that she never let me go to rehearsals. And then, you know, looking back after you, the, the shoot, I think she, she probably, was, it was a good decision, right? So I remember that night, I remember she leaving and um, we went to bed, right? But in the middle of the night, some police came to the house and like grabbed us up and like, there was a lot of, you know, like chaos and like, let's go, Moodle. let's go, let's go, get the kids out of the house. And they drove us to wherever we were going. We never know, I was just like this. I was like, what the fuck? What year? This is like, what year? What is 70, 76? 76. Yeah, Bob get the assassination attempt. 76, yeah. Yeah. So another more impactful experience was with my mom, actually, because we're talking about the 70s and what was going on there, the political upheaval and just, you know, the, the drama, everything. So my so my mother picked us up from school. This was during the height of the there was a big protest going on political. They were blocking the roads, fire burning, tires burning in the streets. So my mom picked us up from school in in the Beatle, in the VW. Mm -hmm. She's driving us home, and um, she, she we, we come up on a roadblock. We can't we can't get home. We're, both, we're not too far from home, but we can't pass because these guys there there's tires burning, and these guys are like, and I remember being in the back seat and watching my mother. She came out of the car and she confronted these guys in a very brave. She's brave. I mean, it, it's brave what she did. She like stand up and say, "Yo, nothing, you know, whatever." I did. She cursed her, do whatever she have to do, and she talked them down, and they kind of like, "Okay," and kind of part. Of, part of the road back and we drove through. So that's a, that's another memory that's like, from, from remember that time and the, the turbulent political situation, those two mileposts is what I go back to. But I mean, there was good times too, man. You know what I mean? I mean, going back to Trenchtown, playing football, you know, it, it was a very double-edged sword that period of time because it was so good too. Yeah. The, the vibe, the energy, the music, there was so much life and there was so much revolutionary like change, you know, like it's the same time Bob and Claude Massop, who was a um a strong man or a strong arm for the, the uh, political faction and Bucky Marshall, they came together and were starting for kind of disown the politics. And I was there too. I met I met all of these guys, take live, and I knew I knew what was happening. Um and I, and I kinda but actually when I got later on I kinda understand who these guys were, because I just saw them as guys, as Bob's friends. Yeah. And I know they were meeting and talking and blah, blah, blah. But when I grew old, I realized these guys were some dangerous men. They weren't just like some laugh. These guys were some serious guys, you know? So 
that is, yeah, that is the world. That is the world, you know, back mm -hmm. in the 70s. I remember, yeah. it's funny, you talk about your mother in that roadblock. My grandfather telling me that he'd be driving down the road and there'd be a roadblock and he got really good at guessing whether it was JLP or PNP, the two <laughs> two parties. So he'd, he'd take a look, he'd say, oh, no, that's JLP. And he'd wave his fist out the window, JLP! They'd like wave yeah, him yeah, through. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, next one would be PNP! <laughs> wave him through. What? What? <laughs> but, um, but, you know, to your point, it's the world that burst this extraordinary amount of your father's music. I mean, it's what gave his music such immediacy and urgency and power. Did your father talk a lot about the kind of the politics of Jamaica? Not, I mean, not to me. I mean, I've heard, I've overheard stuff and I've, you know, but never directed to us. Um, yeah. I mean, he's spoken about it. Obviously, he's not a political person to say, well, him, him decide this politics or that political party or whatever. I think he was a threat because his thing was Rastafari, which is another thing. Mm -hmm. So it's neither PNP or GLP. It's like the, its own yes. thing. And what was happening was that all of the, I mentioned Claude Massa, Bucky Marshall, these were the, the strong arms. These were, these were the, the enforcers of the political parties, the lead enforcers. These guys were coming over to Bob's side. So there was a whole other thing going on that the political powers were losing their, their muscle to this other idea of Rastafari. And that was what Bob was really about, really. If, if it, I mean, if, it, if he was about politics, it was the political party of Rastafari, mm -hmm. which is a spiritual movement. You know, we want to change, change how things are. So I think that was his politics. Rastafari was his politics, we could say, you know? Yeah. I was trying to think whether there's another musical artist who has had the same kind of status in his or her home country as your father did. I mean, I'm remembering that famous concert where the two political figures of the day, Siaga and Manley, didn't mm -hmm. they shake hands on stage at a at a Bob Marley concert? Yeah, the One Love Peace concert. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, the, the analogy would be as if Donald Trump and, and Joe Biden had kind of hugged on stage at a Bruce Springsteen concert, right? That's the that's the close. I mean, but it doesn't even, that doesn't even capture it. I mean, mm -hmm. this is why I love the, the book so much because it takes us back to the the time and the place. Yeah, there's wonderful photos of the One Love concert with Siega and and Michael Manley. Yeah, I remember that. I was there. Me and my brother went on stage. Cause that's what we usually do. Like me and Stephen, my brother Stephen, he would go on stage. We would go on stage uh, in that last song, which is usually Exodus. Those times was tough too, the, the One Love Peace concert. So I remember, let me, let me, I don't think we have any photos at that period, but when Bob, after the assassination attempt, and Bob had come home for the One Love Peace concert, so we all went to the airport and, you know, there was thousands of people at the airport because now Bob was coming back. And the thing is that political strongmen for the parties, political parties now, were on the same page as Bob. And so everyone that support these political parties now, was supporting Bob and, and, and these, these guys who now have their own ideas of peace and less political violence. So the airport was full. And then I was there and I remember the crowd and them pulled Bob and I'm, I'm there, I'm outside now in this crowd, all mixed up with everybody. And Bob get pulled into a car and I'm by the window like this. And Bob, <laughs> Bob does, Bob, why no? And he pulled me through the window. <laughs> <laughs> well, you knew you got left behind. <laughs> <laughs> I got mixed up in the crowd. It was like just crowd. No, and there was no. I had no nanny or nobody watching me. <laughs> <laughs> it's important to remember in this moment in Jamaican history, it's almost like the country is in is in a state of civil war. There is violence everywhere. You know, people are leaving Jamaica in droves to come to the United States or Canada to escape. It's a kind of a crazy period. But it's funny, not only a, a civil war, it's like a geopolitical war going on at the same time between um, the United States and Russia and Cuba because that was the whole thing. That's why Edward Siaga, he was a Boston, he graduated from Boston University. And so there was the geopolitical situation even elevated the stakes even more. Yeah. And Bob, I mean, Bob was in a serious position. and Nobody knew, but he was in a, posi a serious position because of the geopolitical element would, would America allow a socialist government who has ties with Cuba to have another, which, which would then mean Russia having a, a, a more influence in that region? 
you know, America didn't want that and would not allow that. And now there was this guy, this singer guy who, who people were drawn to. And he was like, she had some political power too, because the, the political um, strongmen and their people were now drawn to this singer guy. Who, who's this singer guy? You know what I'm saying? So the stakes were really high beyond what I think we realized, or even Bob might have realized at the time, or people around him, you know? Can you think of a, a musical figure who was analogous to your father? The, yeah, I, I think about um, Fela Kuti from Nigeria. Yeah. And him, he was, you know, he was another one of my, I met him once um, in Chicago, but he was, he was serious. He was real. You know, I mean, what he did in, in Nigeria, standing up against the government, the brutality and the songs he wrote about that really, he, he uh, just like my father, assassination attempt, I mean, they would raid him and beat him and beat his mother and, you know, all type of things. So, Fela Kuti would be a, a, a good analogy to Bob, I think. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And there are a couple, maybe a couple of South African, um, Huma Sekela mm-hmm. maybe mm-hmm. would be a, a good analogy. But when do you become aware that you want to make your life in music? Is that something that comes to you very young and looking at your father or afterwards, after his death? No, it come, it come before that. I mean, the first concert we played was a concert that um, Bob was on. It was mm-hmm. the, the International Year of the Children. What a year that was, though. 79. So he, and he wrote the first song that we ever sung. Yeah. So we was always in music and Bob would always call us to sing when he's writing it. Hey, you know, come sing. Hey, we playing. We want to go play. He's t- telling us to come sing. You know what I said? So we start very young with music. The, the thing I get from Bob, musically speaking, is the discipline and, and the focus and the, the seriousness in which you approach the music the respect that they give the music. So you have to put in the work that shows you respect the music. It's not like you just, and, you know, you have to sing the right, you know, you have to practice, you know. So really when we, we used to sit at rehearsals and watch Bob them rehearse. And I think for some reason, I grew up taking that ethic of hard work and, and, and putting it into my own music and my life in general, you know, whether it be exercising or whatever. I think seeing him just, you know, grind and like, want to make it right and the discipline, the discipline, you know what I said? The discipline is, is really, yeah. is, is, a, is a strong impact on me seeing that discipline as, a, as growing up around that. Can you talk a little bit about the way he made music? I mean, was there, was there a kind of a, an approach that, a particular approach? And can you, can you give, I'd love us of an example of how he worked and how he created. Well, what I saw, and this was probably um, in Miami at his mother's house, yeah? But he always had his guitar around, and a lot of time it's mumbling. You don't really, it's not a song. You just hear ideas coming out. And for me, he would always have fun with it. It was never like a serious, like, writing. And, you know, it, it was always like something very joyful in the process, it was very joyful and happy, and people around and laughing, and, you know, you getting the lyrics, making fun. Um, there, there's this one. And I don't think he ever did release this one. It was released. It's kind of like a, he did it as a demo. Real, it's kind of like a real good time. And I, and I remember him being in Miami in his bedroom with his ovation guitar. And he was just having fun with it. Having a real good time. You know, and people, you know, they must smoke, them spliff. And it's just a good energy. Just a good vibe. You know what I'm saying? It's like, and then I, you never hear when the song complete. You only hear when it come on the record. You hear pieces of it, ideas of things, you know? And then you hear a record. So you never really, I never really hear him complete one song, writing a song completely. You know, you always hear little bits and pieces here and there. Mm. When your father became ill, was there a sense of urgency with him? Did his work take on a, a new kind of seriousness? No, he was always urgent from him. I mean, he was urgent from the get-go because... There are a few examples of that kind of energy, of his urgency, of his um, work ethic, of his determination. So he was in the band Wheelers with, with Bonnie and Peter, these three guys, right? They were in his band. And um, obviously it never worked out because according to what he said in an interview, it was like, and him said these words, he used my name. He says, if him, if you think when Ziggy wants to go to school that he can say, Blah blah. He didn't want to work. He didn't want to do this. What you know? So he wants to work. You know, he he wants to get things done. There was always an urgency. There was never a, a lag time. There was never a lag time. Mm-hmm. 
There was always music. There was never any like, all right, let me take a vacation now. All right, let me go chill out now. There's no, it was like 36, I mean, how much years? 36 years of like pushing, you know, pushing it, pushing it, pushing it, touring, never stopping. So that urgency I feel was always there. Mm -hmm. Of all of his music, what are the songs that speak to you the most? The song that gets me the most is a redemption song because I remember shortly after him passed, that was the album. That was his album. That song was was the emotional spear, the emotional arrow. You know, when you hear that song at that in that time, it so that memory of that song are related to that time period. And it was it's him and his guitar. It's so it's so soulful and just the final the thing is just him and him guitar. And so that song always kind of have an emotional um, impact on me. Yeah. I want to know more about your childhood. There's a lot of moving around. Mm. Your family went to London right after the shooting. Is that right? Yeah, but we we, we never got to London. So, all right. So, Trenchtown, right? Trenchtown. Where, where I was born in Trenchtown. We grew up in a Trenchtown a little bit. Mm -hmm. And then moved to Delaware, where his mother had moved, had migrated to. So we lived in Delaware. Wilmington, Delaware. I went to school, elementary school in Delaware for maybe a year or so. Then we moved back to Jamaica, but we moved out of Trenchtown and moved into a place called Bull Bay, which is a much better standard of living. It's like, you know, not poor, but not rich. It's like the middle, like middle class or something like that in Jamaica at the time. Mm -hmm. But it's funny, within that middle class community, when our mother left, we would stay with our grand aunt. And it was like, we had to walk up the road and up the hill. And she was living in a poor um, a poor class house with no water, no toilet, no nothing. So right within that middle class thing, there's right, if I went to my aunt's house, it was like I was in another neighborhood. And so we would stay with her a lot of times because mommy and daddy would go on tour and then we would have to stay with grandma auntie in that house there. And then after that, we moved to an upper middle class neighborhood now. And then... After my, after my father passed away, my mother moved us into you know, a, a more upper class in the hills with a big house and uh, lots of rooms and stuff like that. So, yeah, that was the movement. And um, for me, it was fun. As a child, everything was a great learning experience. You know, this life with my family, my father, my mother, and, and what they were going through, I was also learning from at the same time. What's it like going back to Jamaica now? You must get mobbed walking down the street. No, I haven't been back in a while still, but going back when I went back last time, Jamaica, I mean, a lot, a lot has changed. A lot of, another generation, a lot of the vibes has changed. Yeah. The outlook has changed. You know, I'm, I'm a lot of more Americanization of, of Jamaica. But the countryside is where the magic still remains. You know, the city, the, the, the city side, I'm not so, I'm not, it's not a, because when we, when we was growing up in a city, it wasn't like a, met, a big metropolitan city. It was like a little town. And it was still had that vibe of like, you're still in Jamaica. But no, it kind of, the city kind of get a little more hectic. And so, but the countryside is, is still where, it's, Jamaica has a vibe to it. Mm -hmm. You don't really get anywhere else for me. You know, um, it's a very inspirational place. Um, if you find the right spot, you know. Yeah. Ian Fleming, he wrote his, his James Bond stuff in Jamaica, no? Goldeneye. Goldeneye. I think yeah. Goldeneye is written in Jamaica. Goldeneye. Near Port Antonio. Is, okay. I think there's a there was a there was a, a house he stayed at. Yes, that's right. Yeah. 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 So plenty of inspiration. <laughs> yeah. It's easy to see why Jamaicans have such a an inflated sense of their own importance. Because <laughs> yeah. the whole world comes running We're very to us. Proud, very proud. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I want to talk about some of the photographs that mean the most to you in this book. My first question was, how many of these photographs did you take or other family members take, and how many of them are professional photographs? Well, um, we, I didn't take, we never take any. These aren't our photographs. These are professional. There's, there's his friend Neville who used to do his lighting and design his album art, have a, some photos in there. But with the book, what, we, what I try to do is um, do a balance of those type of professional, like iconic images and with more like images of... You know, just in real life, outside of the the musician, outside of the stage, you know, show some back, you know, show him beyond that, and for try and, as I said in the book, try and make people even feel a deeper relationship to him. Because if you know someone just as your icon or as your as a as a musician, 
or a, a, a mean a singer, then that's one way of doing it. But if you can get a deeper understanding of his his life during that same period of time, beyond that, then you can feel even more connected to the person on, on, on that level. So that's what I was trying to do with the book, you know, but um, we never, unfortunately, we, at the time, we never really do a lot of, you know, we never have cameras. And we never have a camera. We never have a camera. Yeah. You know what I mean? Photographers have cameras. We don't have cameras. <laughs> was the process of going through all these photographs painful? Must have brought back all kinds of memories. Yeah, no, but joyful, not painful. I mean, melancholy because Bob is not here. And when you look at the photograph, you say, oh, what a young man. I'm 50, I'm 52 now. So when I look at him, he's like, look at this young guy, young kid. You know what I mean? Why, you know, it's, so that is a sad thing. But there's so much, the joy overweigh that. There's so much joy. I'm um, just looking at him and, and, and um, seeing him in that way where I know he was having a good time while he was doing it too. You know, he wasn't upset. He, he was having a good time. He enjoyed, he enjoyed his experience. You know what I mean? So I feel happy about that. I, can, I know he was having a good time doing it, you know? Yeah. There's a photo. Let, we want to talk about the photo. Let's go to um, which pages? 97. Try 90, page 97 if you can count from. It's him, it's him like at his home, in his home, at, in the countryside. Oh, yes. So this, I, I used to, we used to go to the country with him. We, this is St. Anne's. We used to go back with him on a trip. And this, this is just the real Bob. You know what I mean? I said, this is, and these are the people. This is where Bob come from. These are his people. This is his roots. Mm -hmm. he, he was born on this land. And I mean, you can see the, the guy, he's he's coming to, he's either coming from the field or going to the field. He might have some probably yam and stuff in that crocus bag you have there. And everybody, I mean, Bob was just one of the people. He was just one of them. And as you can see, he's, and he's talking, he's eating a banana and, and talking to some of the kids them. You know, and some of them have shoes on, some don't have shoes on, and they're laughing. So Bob, <laughs> well, him, you know, him, him communication with people, good communication skill, you know, with people and, you know, yeah, and just having fun. He was enjoying life. He's sitting on, he's sitting on the stairs here on the next page over. That picture is, is I mean, he's so... You can just tell how relaxed and at home he is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But at the yeah. time this photo was taken, he's at the height of his fame. Yeah, man. After the assassination attempt. So this is, yeah, he's at the height right here. And this is, as you see, this he's leaning on the other page, he's leaning up on the VW van. This is, so we had, my mother had a Beetle and he we he would drive this VW van. I think those are the, the only two kinds of cars there were in Jamaica in those years. <laughs> BW vans and, and BW Beatles. <laughs> so yeah, and yeah. Some of these people, some of them is, is cousins too. There's a couple yeah. of cousins in here. So this is at home. And then this is the last photo from that series, I think. Um, if you go to the next page, it's him sitting down, still in St. Anne's. But he's alone, his guitar is on the floor here, on, on the ground right here. And he's, um, he's barefoot also right there. But this photo now is like, this is Bob. I think Bob was always like a loner. And he always felt alone, although he had so many people around him. This is Bob. This is him in his, like, this is his meditation. This is him, like, in his space, you know what I'm saying? Alone and just vibing. I felt like he felt like he was always alone. Um, in some way, you know, and this kind of represent that loneliness in a way. We'll be back with more from Ziggy Marley after this quick break. We're back with the rest of Malcolm's conversation with Ziggy Marley. As an added bonus, you'll hear the Live Talks Los Angeles moderator take questions from the audience at the end of Malcolm's interview. I love some of these group shots. There's, there's on page 50, there's this fantastic group shot. With a band. The band, yeah. So this, all right, so this photo now was taken in, in, in England. I was here, I was there. Oh, really? We were either on the way to Zimbabwe or coming from Zimbabwe. That's why the next photo of me, if, if you look at the next photo, this is England too. So this is this is the time period we were there, um, right before Zimbabwe or after Zimbabwe. We were in England yeah. and I had went on the trip with him. And you know, football as usual. I had not realized the extent to which he was a soccer. First of all, I know you're his son, but I want you to be honest. Mm. How good was he? He was good. I mean, I remember he played against me when I was in, um, you know, sometimes in appearance versus, I, I was on the soccer team in elementary school. 
And I remember he came, there was parents versus, you know, students. And, you know, so he came and I was like, yeah, I'll mark this guy. I'll mark this. I'll, I have this guy. I'll take him. <laughs> but um, he was fast, which is good. Yeah. And he had a good kick. And um, he was a good player. He was a good player, man. Because he, he idolized soccer player. One of his good friends was Alan Skillcold, who was like the top Jamaican player at the time. And they were good friends. So, I mean, he kept fit. He kept... His workout was like a, a professional soccer player workout. You know, abdominals, you know, running on the sand, playing soccer. Like that was that was a that was a workout. It's a soccer player workout, basically. And his friends, all of his friends were soccer players or could play soccer. Yeah. You know, so he was drawn towards you know, people like that, you know. But Ziggy, to be a fan of Jama- of Jamaican soccer is it exercise in masochism it's like the i know this from my cousins nothing is more painful than this team that just loses and loses and loses <laughs> no but the funny thing is that we have some of the best players in the world but i don't know because <laughs> we, we are, i think we had some great players you know um but we have the best runner well you always have the best runners we're the fastest runner though yeah, that's all but that's been true <laughs> forever um i want to talk a little bit about your own music mm. and you must have thought about you have this extraordinary gift, which is the gift of your father and his legacy, but it also presents a, a challenge to kind of carve out your own identity in that. How have you approached that? Yeah, when I go back and look at my history, right, our family history. So we have musicians and artists on both sides of my family. A lot of people always talk about my father's legacy. My mother is, was also key in... in um, in everything. My mother was actually key in Bob's success. Without my mother, Bob wouldn't be as successful. I wouldn't even have what he has. She was the one who reintroduced him or introduced him to the Rastafarian culture, which had a big impact on him mentally and spiritually. Uh, she's the one who, when they didn't have nothing, she's the one who gave him somewhere to sleep. And she was the one who slept on the floor with him in the studios, who sold records with him. Um, on their head, riding their bicycles through the, through the streets. She was the one who got shot in her head, same time he got shot in the hand and still showed up for the concert when other people were like, no, we're not going. She still had a bullet in her head. So her impact on his legacy and, and where we are is, I always remember that too. You know, mm-hmm. when I think about my, um, what you just asked me about, you know, making my own way or whatever. I remember that. What I have is not just coming from my father. It's coming from my fa- my mother. Her grandfather, uh, her father, my grandfather was a saxophone player. My father, mother, and his family were all church people, singers. They sing in churches. And so the spirit, there, there's, you know, so it's, it's, a, it's both sides. And for me, yes, I understand the question of my father and his his weight or his, his impact and what it would mean to someone like me or a son of any person like Bob and and how we kind of who are we who choose to be in the same line of work kind of have to overcome whatever that thing is so for me never really was on the forefront of my mind I and it was on the peripherals and I, and I heard it I heard them thing and I heard it but I never pay much attention to it I started seeking a spiritual path when I was a teenager so my whole mental state was evolved beyond that because I was looking. And it's because of my father I was looking, you know, because of his spirituality led me to search for my spirituality. And so for me, I was way past my ego of trying or or thinking about or putting that pressure on myself to live up to the legacy or to make my own name or make my own way. I don't need to make my own way. I just need to be myself. That will that will solve all the problem. That will solve the problem that people is asking the question about. I don't need to like try to do it. I just need to be true. And then that that is what that is how it really is. And I also need to accept, and I do accept that my father is a part of me. There's gonna be similarities. There's gonna be things that is like, you know, is like Bob. You know what I mean? So we're not trying to this this um distance ourselves from him in that way either so there's no that struggle doesn't exist because i don't want to distance myself from him because i am a part of him anyway you cannot do that you you're, he has a son called you're running away you're running away but you can't run away from yourself you know what i said so 
that is how I that is how I really um try, that is how I I sim- when I analyze it myself after being asked that question, that is how I see myself mm-hmm. uh, having dealt with it in that way, you know. And yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, that's beautifully put. Yeah. Well, thank you, Ziggy. I think we have some questions, Ted. Is that right? But this is like I said, the book the book was so lovely and took me back yeah. to. So many kind of wonderful memories of that era in Jamaica, and it's a real thrill to talk to you about it. Me too. Same thing. All right. Uh, thank you, Malcolm. The first question, uh, Ziggy, is um, have you been to Ethiopia, and can you say something about your connection and your father's connection to Ethiopia? Yeah, we were in Ethiopia years back to celebrate. I think it was the 60th, uh, one of those birthdays, Bob, because um, obviously yeah, Ethiopia and um, its history, we found a strong connection to through um, the Rastafari culture. It's a deep story um, because, and I've, I've probably, yeah, let me cut it short. Living in Jamaica during the times of after independence or, you know, where's the post-slavery or whatever, the Christian faith and the faith that was forced upon us by the colonists was something that, a sector of, you know, Jamaicans started to turn against, like, you know, this is a slave master thing, you know, why God, why Jesus is a white guy with blue eyes and blah, blah, blah. Where is our, who do we identify with? And so Marcus Gavin really started a whole conversation on this and, and said some stuff, you know, when Marcus was talking about black thing and the black one and, you know, your black identity, that was a strong inspiration. And then when Rastafari started using the same Bible, that was given to them by the colonists to now interpret it in a way that put an emphasis on this king in Ethiopia as the re as the coming of another Christ-like individual. In that um, philosophy, in that in that idea, a lot of people in Jamaica found a, a real independence, a full break from the colonialist, not only the political independence but the mental independence. And that was the rise of the Rastafari culture and the connection with Ethiopia, with this king who, within the Bible, is still represented because he is a lineage of King Solomon. And in the Bible, it says he will come again with the name King of Kings, Lord of Lords, conquering on a tribe of Judah. And this was the title that this man, has, this man has. And so that strong connection to Ethiopia is forged through that because Exodus, you know, Bob had an album called Exodus, and Exodus obviously is a relation to the, the struggle of is, the Israel people coming out of Egypt. And so we had a strong connection with that whole thing, with David and Solomon. And um, so Rastafari come through that connection with Elis Selassie I as a descendant of Solomon. And so Ethiopia, yeah, Ethiopia was a big, Ethiopia was like our um, Jerusalem or Mecca or whatever, the, you know. Yeah, that was, Ethiopia was like that for for the Rastafari culture. So your siblings have uh, crafted their own music careers. Um, the questioner asks, what is the relationship between your siblings, both musically and, and how do you relate to each other today? So we grew up, all right, so we grew up, this come back how we grew now, because it's very important, because all right, my, my father was married to my mother, but he had ch- children out of wedlock, right? Because obviously... <laughs> The wedlock thing is a colonial thing and we don't deal with colonial things. You know, we are free or whatever. <laughs> so that was my father's, you know, philosophy. After you learn things, then you just free yourself. Anyway, but so we always grew up, you know, when like my father would take us to visit, like I'm the oldest son, right? So he would take me and sometimes my brother Stephen, you know, there was a new, there was a new baby or a new, you know, he would drive us to the, the house where, the, where my, bro- my other brother was who was not of my mother. And, you know, he would visit and we would meet, you know, Kimani or meet Robbie or meet Rowan or whoever it was. And my mother now, which is the most important part of this, was always, she was like the mother of all of them. Like she was the mother of the children who she wasn't the mother of, basically. So everybody would come to us and, you know, my mother would be the one who, kind of take care of Bob children, whether it was his child or not. And she is the one who never, she never taught us to like be like vindictive or hateful or resentful of my father or of the other children in no way. We were just one family. 
So that's how we, that's the lesson we have learned. Nobody, have, nobody taught us that, oh, you shouldn't like that guy because he's not your mother's son. We never learned that. So that's how we still are today. We get together every now and again, but we have a, such a strong connection that we don't have that emotion, that deep emotional sadness or like, oh, I miss my thing or oh, my brother or something like that. You know, we, we never grew up that way. We grew up a little bit less emotional, I would say. So we don't have that in us. But we do have a connection um, and a love for each other and a respect for each other. We never fight each other. We never, you know, we understand each other and, and everybody understand each other. So that's how we live. Musically, me and my brother Stephen, we share a lot of music. Damien, Steve is the one who nurtured Damien. We nurture each other music, basically. Each, each of us. I, I, I helped Steve when he was young. Steve helped his younger brother and it just, we just keep nurturing each other. So that's how it is. Uh, final question has to do, and there were several people who asked questions about musical collaborations. Is there anyone you would have liked to see your father have collaborated with that he did not get to? And how do you feel about musical collaborations? Who would you like to collaborate with? No, oh, musical collaborations are a good thing, right? We, we, in some ways, it is expanding each of the artists' reach to other audiences, which is good. It is showing a, a true example of unification in a way where it can be two different types of music blending together to, to bring, to make something new. I'm a very shy person. So I don't like to ask people for things. I don't really like to ask people, you know, like, hey, can you do this? <laughs> you know, so I'm very shy like that. But for some reason this year, um, during the COVID thing, I've, I've done the most collaborations I've ever done in 10 years which is very strange. It's a, it's a very interesting time for me. Um, and how those come about? Well, the first collaborations I, I did last year was from a kid's album. And I think when I do children's music, I find it's a diff- I have a different state of mind than when I do, when I do the other ty- the, my other music. I don't know. Somehow I feel more, um, more comfortable with asking somebody to do something for children music. And it has something to do with that we have a charitable element to it. Um, and so I'm much more comfortable doing that. So I did a, I did a few big collaborations with um, Ben Harper, Cheryl Crow, Alanis Morissette, Angelique Kijo, Tom Morello, Buster Rhymes. So my kids' album have a, like, a bag of collaboration, which we really enjoy doing. And how I work with collaboration is that we have to have a connection. It can't just be like a corporate deal. It can't be like a... a, 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 a you know, just have a contractual relationship. We, it has to be something real. And that is why I've, I haven't done a lot of collaboration. But all of these artists that are on that album, I've done for years. We've done music together. You know, we, we talk and we text or whatever. So that's how I like to do collaborations. For Bob, um, I can't speculate on that. I, do, I don't want to speculate on that. Bob, you know, he was in a collaborative band, The Wailers. He collaborated with Peter and Bunny. And I know... Um, Steve Wonder joined them on stage. I think the collaborate and there was also um, what's his name came back stage. What's the Beatles guy name? George Harrison. So I feel like um, Bob collaboration collaborational spirit was one where if he was on stage and somebody wanted to come up, he would welcome them up. Collab- he's a he's a social person. Come on up and sing. I, I don't, I'm not sure about recording. Um, I don't know about that. And I, there's no way I, I can't even imagine it. I can't even speculate on that. Well, thanks for uh, joining us, Ziggy Marley. Uh, thank you, Malcolm Gladwell, for uh, chatting with Ziggy. All right, Malcolm. Thanks, man. Take care. Be safe, guys. Pleasure, Ziggy. Bye-bye. Thanks to Ziggy Marley for sharing so many fascinating details about his life with Bob. The book he curated, Bob Marley, Portrait of the Legend, is available now. And to hear a playlist of our favorite Bob and Ziggy Marley songs, check out the playlist we created at brokenrecordpodcast.com. Be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel at youtube.com slash brokenrecordpodcast, where you can find extended cuts of new and old episodes. You can follow us on Twitter at Broken Record. Broken Record is produced with help from Leah Rose, Jason Gambrell, Martin Gonzalez, Eric Sandler, and Jennifer Sanchez. With engineering help from Nick Chafee, our executive producer is Mia LaBelle. Broken Record is a production of Pushkin Industries. And if you like the show, please remember to share, rate, and review us on your podcast app. 
Our theme music's by Kenny Beats. I'm Justin Richmond. Peace. <laughs> <laughs>